towards a nonviolence to all beings through compassion, supported through pillars of connection, education, inspiration, and action. Tonight, I hope you learn something new and you're inspired to take action. It's only with your help that we can create a more compassionate world. You can support Love in Arms, all of our residents, compassionate businesses, artists, and caring individuals by registering for our fifth annual gala. So many people have generously given of their money, time, and talent so that our wider community can become involved in the mission of Love in Arms. Please go to loveinarms.org 2020 gala and register. This is only step one. You must also then download the Givey app to participate in the silent auction that's happening right now. We have over 100 amazing items. Then also on the day of the gala, you must have the Givey app to participate in the paddle raise and the live auction. Now it is truly my privilege to introduce Philip Olin, tonight's guest speaker. At the age of 34, he was vice president of Citibank. The financial press named him in the top 40 brightest and best executives in Australia. During his travels by age of 40, he witnessed cruelty so egregious, he decided to do all he could to alleviate suffering and give away everything he owned with warm hands and die broke. He jokes so far, we are right on budget. Today, he is venture capitalist for good causes, supporting some 500 mission critical projects for children, animals, and the environment in 40 plus countries promoting Ahimsa Nonviolence and veganism is his main interest. I can't even begin to list all of his achievements and awards. Please go to our website for more information. It is truly one of our greatest honors to present Philip Wolin. No, nope. Faith, you're good. We are good. I had some, some music in the background. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> You know, people uh, in our movement come to the movement for various reasons. Come, some of them become vegan uh, for health reasons or for the environment or animal cruelty, reasons like that, uh, but not me. Um, they, they say that you, uh, you always remember your first love, but not for me. I have no recollection of that at all but I do remember my first hate, and that was the hatred of animal cruelty. Now that hatred has grown exponentially ever since. Well, as I often say, you know, King Lear late at night on the cliffs asks the blind Earl of Gloucester, how do you see the world? And the blind man Gloucester replies, I see it feelingly. Gloucester must have been a vegan. Now, Rudyard Kipling, the Anglo-Indian poet and writer, and Nobel laureate, wrote of young men dying in World War I. And if they ask you why we died, tell them that our fathers lied. Everything we think we know about the meat and dairy industry is a preposterous lie. And that legacy of lies continues today. You see, the world is crying out today for only two things, leadership and the truth. So today, just let's all tell the truth, fearlessly and forcefully. That is what the Sanskrit word Satyagraha means, the truth force. The wise Chinese have a term for it, Zheng Zhao. Listen to the friend who tells you the truth, even when it hurts. So let's just tell the truth, fearlessly and forcefully. Now, Brennan Kennelly in the book of Judas wrote, if you want to serve your age, betray it. But what does that mean to betray your age? It means expose its lies, humiliate its conceits, debunk its arrogance, and condemn them to face harsher truths. Alvin Toffler said that the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. Now, I have long admired Count Moltke, the great Prussian general, the soldier who preferred to think rather than to speak, a man silent in seven languages. You see, it actually takes courage to stand up and speak. 
but it also takes courage to sit down and listen. Now, there was a time when my favorite food was filet mignon and lobster, a fact for which I'm so profoundly ashamed today. So what made me decide as a young investment banker to leave that world of lobsters and Learjets in exchange for shelters and slaughterhouses? What made me decide to give everything away? To take nothing but pictures, own nothing but memories, leave nothing but footprints, kill nothing but time. You see, something happened to me. I heard the screams of my dying father as his body was ravaged by the many cancers that killed him. And I realized I'd heard those screams before. In the slaughterhouse, on the cattle ships to the Middle East, and a dying mother whale as a harpoon explodes in her brain as she calls out to her calf. Their cries were the cries of my father. They were identical. And I discovered that when we suffer, we suffer as equals. And in their capacity to suffer, a dog is a pig, is a bear, is a boy. So today I recall the words of the Greek poet Horace, change only the name, and my story is also about you. So briefly, without any pictures attached, and I could have shown them, but they're very gory. This is the way we work today. In China, 7,000 magnificent moon bears, their limbs torn off in traps, are imprisoned in steel coffins welded shut as a catheter drains bile into a bucket which the Chinese drink. The bears go insane. For 26 years, they can't move. In Korea, dogs are beaten to death in the marketplace because the Korean butchers believe that pain and suffering makes the meat tasty. In South Africa, 5,000 tame orphan lions are drugged and then killed with guns, spears are torn apart by hunting dogs and they call it sport. In Canada, thousands of baby seal pups are clubbed and skinned alive on the ice, their tiny hearts still beating. And here in my country, in Australia, we killed 90 million kangaroos who adorn our coat of arms, the largest land animal slaughter on the planet. And we sent millions of our animals bought on Australian soil on death ships to the Middle East where their eyes are stabbed out and their tendons are slashed. Every penny I invested in the Basatine slaughterhouses in Egypt to improve the conditions was utterly wasted. In Asia, dogs are suspended on steel hooks and skinned alive to make trim and fur coats sold in the West. And as you all know, my involvement with Sea Shepherd, we treat the ocean as a private pantry and as a public toilet. The Pacific gyro now is so full of plastic junk and human feces, it has created a floating footprint bigger than India. And dolphins and whales are stabbed to death in the shallows of Japan and the Faroes Islands. Huge bays are blood red. 100 million sharks are torn from the sea every year. Their fins hacked off and their bodies thrown overboard to die agonizing deaths for shark fin soup. And factory farms spew chemicals into the ocean, creating hypoxic dead zones of 1 million square kilometers killing plants, coral, and ocean animals. And so-called unviable dairy calves who cannot be sold for veal are killed by farmers smashing their skulls in or jumping on their rib cages and crushing their hearts because that's the law. And billions of bouncy little chicks are ground up alive in macerators simply because they're male. And as you know, we travel a lot into very strange countries and religious sacrifice that we have seen makes the 21st century look like the new dark ages. Whilst children in poor countries starve because their crop lands now produce meat for foreigners. That's where we work. Now in human history, only 100 billion human beings have ever lived. Seven and a half billion people are alive today. And we human beings torture and kill 2 billion sentient living, loving animals every week. We stab and suffocate 1 billion ocean animals every eight hours. 
If we were killed at the same rate, we'd be wiped out in one weekend. Trillions of fish are ground up into pellets to feed the livestock. Vegetarian cows are now the world's largest ocean predators. You see, the oceans are dying in our time. By 2048, all our fisheries will be dead. The lungs and the arteries of the earth. And you know, oceans sequester more CO2 than all the forests of the world put together. 10,000 entire species are wiped out every year because of the actions of one species. And we now face the sixth mass extinction in cosmological history. If any other organism did this, a biologist would call it a virus. It is a crime of unimaginable proportions. Now, you know, there are two peak predators on this planet, humans on land and orcas in the ocean. In the, in the 20th century, human beings killed 200 million members of their own species. Orcas killed none. And in the 20th century, 100 million people have been killed by their own governments. We shouldn't expect any help from our governments in the future. Now, Victor Hugo said there is nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. But I say there is nothing more destructive than a bad idea whose time has passed. The time for meat has passed. Happily for all of us, the world is changing. 20 years ago, Twitter was a bird sound. WWW was a stuck keyboard. Cloud was in the sky. Skype was a typo. 3G was a parking space. Google was a baby's burp. And Al Qaeda was my plumber. Now, I recently spoke in the European Parliament, in the Israeli Knesset Parliament in Jerusalem, the Parliament in The Hague, the Parliament of World Religions in, in Australia, and in all of them I've said, the most beautiful word ever written in any language at any time in human history came from India, from the Upanishads 3000 years ago. Ahimsa, non-violence to any living being. Now, it's a beautiful word, not because it describes our nationality, our politics, our religion, our diet, or our lifestyle, but because it describes our character. It says we reject violence wherever and whenever it arises in our streets, our homes, our thoughts, our hearts, and at our dining tables. You see, it's not just about animal rights. It really is about human wrongs. Animal rights today is now the greatest social justice issue since the abolition of slavery. It truly is a revolutionary event, more powerful than the Industrial Revolution, the Reformation, the Hubble Telescope, or anything ever conceived by Galileo, Copernicus, Copernicus Einstein, Darwin, or Freud. Because it protects the most precious of all things, life. So the growing vegan movement is on the right side of history. They are creating the new enlightenment, the second Renaissance. Now, here in the West, we all know about the golden rule from the New Testament of Jesus. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Pretty obvious. But it actually goes back further to the Babylonian Jew, Hillel, 70 years BC. In fact, it goes back even further to the Analects of Confucius, 500 years BC. Indeed, it predates the dawn of writing in Mesopotamia 6,000 years ago. It's been inscribed on our hearts forever. Now, the great anthropologist Margaret Mead said, never doubt that a few committed people can change the world. Indeed, that is the only thing that ever has. Well, there are only 13 million Jews in the world. But look at the number of Nobel Prizes they win every year. Tricks and I sat in a stadium at the Olympic Games, full of pride, as Australia won more medals than every country in the world, with the exception 
of Russia and the United States. And we have a population smaller than Florida. Tibet's population is only 3 million, but who hasn't heard the plight of the Tibetan? But there are over 600 million vegetarians and vegans in the world, 600 million. And that is bigger than the United States, England, France, Germany, Spain, Italy, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Israel, all put together. If we were one nation, we would be bigger than the 27 nations of the European Union. We are bigger than NATO. We are bigger than OPEC. And despite this massive demographic footprint, we are still drowned out by the raucous hunt and shoot and kill and cretins who believe that violence is an answer when it should not even be a question. But we live in a world of sound bites and tweets. It reminds me of Hannah Arendt's book, Eichmann in Jerusalem, where she coins the term, the banality of evil. This is how a deceitful journalist at the Australian of the Year Awards twisted my innocent words. Mr. Wallen, I'm surprised a man of your standing would say that meat is murder, a little old lady with a budge regard is offending God, livestock production is unethical, there will be no peace until we stop killing animals, Industry is unattractive. Animals are like human children. Can't you see how offensive that is to our conservative rural audience? Well, this was my diplomatic counterpunch. Well, you certainly bludgeoned the English language to death, but if you're going to quote me, please do it honestly. I did say, a robin red breast in a cage puts all heaven in the rage. But that was William Blake in Auguries of Innocence. And yes, I did say the commandment, thou shalt not kill, applies to the murder of any living being. It was inscribed on the human breast long before it was proclaimed from Mount Sinai. As long as there are slaughterhouses, there will be battlefields. That was Leah Tolstoy. And yes, I did say, the roots of cruelty are not strong, just widespread. But a time will come when inhumanity, protected by custom, will succumb to humanity championed by thought. A man is ethical only when all life is sacred to him. But that came from Albert Schweitzer, also a Nobel Prize winner. And yes, I did say, as long as we kill animals, there will never be peace. It's only one step of the concentration camps of Hitler and Stalin. There will be no justice as long as man will stand with a knife and destroy those who are weaker than him. But that was Isaac Singer another Nobel laureate. And yes, okay, I admit I did have something to say about animals and children. The wolf will die, lie down with the lamb, the leopard with the young goat, the young lion with the young ones of the herd, and a little child will lead them. But that came from the prophet Isaiah. And no, I didn't say a damn thing about greed and ambition. That wasn't me. That was Jesus. Blame him. Behold the birds of the air and the lilies of the field, King Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed as one of these. And just for good measure, he threw in a left hook and an uppercut. Whatever you do to the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. So are you as a journalist so offended in such an egregious way and your rural conservative audience is upset with me? Are you upset? and offended by Nobel laureates and your own prophets? Or should I just go home and burn my books? I seem to recall that was the strategy favored by Pol Pot. Well, he was very upset and speechless, and he called me a radical. You know, we need another radical Copernicus and Galileo to remind us that we are not the center of the universe. As it's been said before, animals are not just other species, they're other nations, and we murder them at our moral peril. Carl Sagan's picture from the Voyager spacecraft showed a tiny microscopic pinhole from space. And he described planet Earth as our beautiful home, our pale blue dot suspended on a sunbeam. Imagine the poetry of that a pale blue dot suspended on a sunbeam. 
Well, human beings today comprise 30% of the biomass of all the land animals on the planet. Human beings, 30%. Slaughterhouse animals account for 66%. Wild animals and nature have been decimated, butchered down to 4%. 70% of the birds on this planet are in cages awaiting slaughter. We have turned Carl Sagan's beautiful pale blue planet Earth into blood-stained planet slaughterhouse, a pox on our species. Now the great historian Barbara Tuckman, you would know, described folly as acting against our own best interests. That's folly. And Occam's Razor, named after the 14th century Jesuit priest, says that when presented with a number of different solutions to a problem, the simplest one is always the best. So let's just apply these tests to the meat and dairy industry. Forest depletion by these industries costs three times as much as the global financial crisis every year. Zoonotic diseases like SARS, mad cow, avian flu, and COVID-19 spread from caged animals threatening a pandemic to rival the Black Death, which wiped out half of Europe. The World Bank used to say that one influenza pandemic would cost $3 trillion, and the CDC now lists over 100 dangerous zoonotic diseases coming down the pike. You might remember the, how people attacked me in 2014 when I gave a big speech in Melbourne and urged them to watch a movie called Contagion, where a bird flu spreads rapidly. And I said very bluntly to the audience, when you watch this movie, don't treat it like a movie. Treat it like a documentary of events that haven't yet happened. And look what's happening today. And meat and dairy, of course, is killing us with cancers, heart disease, osteoporosis, and diabetes. Harvard University says that one third of all early deaths could be prevented simply by not eating meat. I'm sure, uh, Shelley, you would know, Dr. Casley, while he wrote in The Lancet, that India will soon account for 70% of the world's cardiovascular disease due largely to their addiction to dairy. And in India, people are addicted to dairy. It's a very powerful negative vector force. Uh, Medicare and bad, bad diets have already bankrupted the once powerful the United States. They would need $8 trillion invested in treasury bills just to pay the interest. And they've got precisely zero, or as I would say, la dues, nothing. They could shut down every school, university, army, navy, air force, homeland security, FBI, and CIA, and they still will not be able to pay these doctor's bills. So how big is $8 trillion? Well, that's how much the whole of Asia needs for the next 10 years for all their projects in electricity, roads, border telecommunications, high-speed rail across China, ports in Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, plus the new Silk Road from Central Asia through Europe. It is four times as big as India's GDP and double the total reserves of India and China combined. Now my debate that some of you may have seen, I don't know, called Get Animals Off the Menu, went viral with over 30 million viewers and independently translated into 20 languages. And Oxford University calculated that if it were adopted, it would save $30 trillion in health and environmental damage alone. Antibiotics pumped into animals now causes antimicrobial resistance in humans, which will kill 10 million people per annum by 2050 and cost the global economy $100 trillion. Now, if you thought $8 trillion was big, what do you say about $100 trillion? And that's just from antimicrobial bacteria resistance. This is 60 times as much as the whole world spends on aircraft carriers, missiles, bombs, bullets, drones, destroyers, tanks, planes, mines, guns, and spies. That's it from just one thing. Of course, you'd know that water now is the new oil. Nations will soon be going to war over it. Underground aquifers that took millions of years to fill are now running dry. 
As a young teenage boy scout, I drilled my first bore well in a place called Bangalore and struck sweet water at 80 feet. Today, we built an orphanage nearby and at 800 feet was sucking mud. In China, at 3,000 feet, the drill head is still dry and China has some of the world's best engineers and hydrologists. Now, you'd be outraged if 10 jumbo jets crashed every day with no survivors. Well, the same number of children die every day from water-related diseases. The mighty Colorado River, the Rio Grande, the Indus, the Yellow Rivers, now frequently don't reach the sea, sucked dry by the meat and dairy industry, whilst 4 billion people suffer from water scarcity. So why do I speak about water? Because it takes 50,000 liters of water to produce one kilo of beef. 1,000 liters of water to produce one liter of milk. And a dairyman makes 28 cents a liter for that milk. What a preposterously stupid industry. Mad Hatter economics on steroids. One billion people a day are hungry. 20 million people will die this year from malnutrition. Cutting meat by only 10% will feed 100 million people and going vegan will end malnutrition forever. And food prices are skyrocketing. You know, it used to cost me for Thai rice for my projects in Southeast Asia, 197 US dollars a ton. And then went up to $1,015 a ton. A five-fold increase in five months. And poor countries sell their grain to the West for hard currency, whilst their own children starve in their arms, and the West feeds it to livestock. So we can eat a steak. I bet I'm not the only one who sees that as a crime. Believe me, every morsel of meat we eat is slapping the tear-stained face of a hungry child. When I look into her eyes, do I remain silent? If everyone ate a Western diet, we'd need two planet Earths to feed us. We've only got one, and she is dying. The Earth can produce enough food for everyone's need, but not enough for everyone's greed. And greenhouse gas pollution is from livestock now vastly exceed those of transport, cars, trains, buses, ships, lorries, the lot. The melting Siberian permafrost, I don't know if you've ever been to the Amar Peninsula in Russia, is now a ticking time bomb. When it releases its sequestered gas, the game is over, we're finished. The Himalayan ice fields, as you would know, are correctly called the third pole because they feed half the world's population to the Ganges, the Indus, the Brahmaputra, the Yangtze, the Irrawaddy, the Mekong, and the Yellow Rivers. And these glaciers are melting fast. I presented these numbers in a speech to 2,000 wealthy Indian entrepreneurs in the Rajiv Gandhi Center in New Delhi. And in the front row was sitting Amartya Sen, who had just won India's Nobel Prize in Economics. And I also mentioned to Mohammed Yunus after he won the Nobel Peace Prize that all the good that he had done would vanish when Bangladesh drowns. To say nothing about Manila, Mumbai, Calcutta, Ho Chi Minh City, and Bangkok. And then Drix and I had dinner with Al Gore and we discussed the same numbers. And more recently here in Melbourne, I had to give a speech with Dr. Peter Dirty, Australia's Nobel Prize winner in medicine. No argument from these great minds about anything I said, only from the grubby meat and dairy lobby. So Upton Sinclair was right. It is impossible to get a man to understand something if his salary depends on him not understanding it. The American uh, Admiral uh, Denny McGinn, the chief of US warfighting requirements said, we have learned that nations will raid and invade long before they starve. And here in the West, we freak out when 1,000 refugees arrive on our shores. Just imagine for a moment, greenhouse gas emissions hitting 500 parts per million or a three degree temperature rise, creating 100 million equal refugees. And that's a minimum number, that's baseline. This calamity will reshape the geopolitical landscape forever. We are facing the perfect storm. If any nation had developed weapons that could wreak such havoc on the planet, we would launch a preemptive military strike 
and bomb it back into the Bronze Age. But we can't, because it is not a rogue state. It's an industry, meat. The good news is we don't have to bomb it. We can just stop buying it. So George Bush was wrong. The axis of evil does not run through Iraq, Iran, and North Korea. It runs through our dining tables. Weapons of mass destruction are our knives and forks, and increasingly nowadays, our chopsticks. You see, the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. This disgusting, ignoble, vile industry will end because we run out of excuses. And that is why I say that veganism is the Swiss army knife of an ethical future. One instrument, one instrument solves our ethical, economic, environmental, water and health problems and ends animal cruelty forever. Because it rearranges the furniture of your mind. And farmers are the ones with the most to gain. Farming won't end, it would boom. Only the product line would change. Farmers would make so much money they wouldn't even bother counting it and I'd be the first to applaud them. Believe me, veganism is the engine of redirected economic growth. Governments would love us. New industries would emerge and flourish. Hospital waiting lists would disappear. Health insurance premiums would plummet. Hell, we'd be so healthy, we'd have to shoot someone just to start a cemetery. I always say that veganism also gives us the peace dividend. I said at the Parliament of World Religions that the peace map is drawn on a menu. Peace is not just the absence of war, it is the presence of justice. So talking about peace while still killing animals is like loving literature and burning books. They are mutually exclusive ideas. And justice must be blind to race, color, religion, and to species. If it is not blind, it will be used as a weapon of terror. And there is unimaginable terror in those ghastly gulags we call factory farms and slaughterhouses, as Lord Acton said, where absolute power corrupts absolutely. We need a new form of jurisprudence, a foro conscientiae, a court of the conscience. So in my journey through Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, I've learned that a man is measured not by how much money he makes, but by how much of it is willing to give away, particularly to strangers. And if you wish to increase a man's share of happiness, do not aim to increase his possessions, simply decrease his desires. So Socrates and Epicurus were right. The unexamined life is not worth living. It's not a life, it's a life sentence. Believe me, you do not find your character on Wall Street because it lives on the road to Damascus. And my heart resonates to the words of the poet W.H. Auden, if equal affection cannot be, let the more loving one be me. Martin Luther King said, cowardice asked the question, is it safe? Expediency asked the question, is it polite? Vanity asked the question, is it popular? But conscience asked the question, is it right? Is it right to torture and kill another living being for our taste buds? Now I speak to many audiences in many countries around the world and they're all good, caring, loving, decent people who all want to change the world. As long as they don't have to change themselves. But life doesn't work that way. First we change in our hearts and then the world follows. So true leaders must 
face their own demons courageously. Martin Niemöller, the German priest, philosopher, and U-boat captain, spent eight years in prison for condemning German intellectuals for being cowards. And he wrote, when the Nazis came for the communists, I remained silent. I was not a communist. When they locked up the Democrats, I remained silent. I was not a Democrat. When they came for the trade unionists, I did not speak out. I was not a trade unionist. When they came for the Jews, I remained silent. I was not a Jew. And then they came for me and there was no one left to speak out. Men and women of goodwill and integrity must speak out and act courageously. Is it not better to light a candle than to curse the darkness? All the darkness in the world cannot put out the light of a single candle. You see, I believe another world is dawning. And if I close my eyes, I can feel her heartbeat. And I tell activists, do not be afraid. I know it won't be easy, but fear should not be on your agenda. Always remember Gandhi's words. First they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. The last sentence of Scott Fitzgerald's book, The Great Gatsby reads, so we beat on, boats against the tide, drawn back ceaselessly into the past. I ask you, are we to live forever in a sick, smug, and cruel past? Let's not relive history, let's make history, because that is what leaders do. They make history. Judge White's closing words in the Bonfire of the Vanities were these. The law is humanity's first attempt at decency. So I ask everybody who listens to you to join us in a battle, in a war, that decency cannot afford to lose. Because in the end, only three things matter. How deeply you loved, how gently you lived, and how gracefully you let go of things that were not meant for you. Meat was not meant for you. Our animal cousins have survived millions of years of evolution They've earned the right to share this planet with us in peace, and they've waited long enough. The brutes and the bullies have been Goliath, but David is coming. Maybe he is in this audience. Maybe he's one of you. And if not you, who? And if not now, when? I think I've said enough. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Philip, for your inspiring words. Now's the time to act. Register for the 2020 Gala. Every dollar you donate will be matched by a generous donor, doubling your impact. Please go to loveandarms.org 2020 Gala. Thank you so much.